Bibles this day, I want you to find with me the book of 2 Peter, the book of 2 Peter this morning. 2 Peter chapter number 1 is where we'll find ourselves today. The Lord's impressed on my heart. Uh, just an incredibly simple message that I believe has a, a, a profound power when we realize what Peter is communicating not only to the original recipients but to us as well this day. I want to preach on the subject, the facts of faith, the facts of faith. If you're able to do so, stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to encourage you to turn to someone close to you and uh, say, I'm going to say amen, how about you? <laughs> now, y'all wouldn't lie in church now, would you? <laughs> hmm? Yeah. We'll, we'll be listening to see today. Here's what the Bible says, the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1. We'll just read the first two verses for our text today. 2 Peter, chapter number 1, verse number 1, on the subject, the facts of faith. Here's what the Bible says. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied into you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let us pray together this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for everyone who's gathered in this building this day, those that are joining us via various means of technology. Father, we just thank you that because of you we can gather Lord, because of you, we have fellowship one with another. Because of you, uh, we understand that we have a heavenly home awaiting. Because of you, we've been made anew and afresh, not through our own righteousness, but through yours. So, Father, this day I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. I, I pray, Lord God, that you would not only foster our faith, Lord, but uh, you would allow the faith that we have to grow in you. And, Lord, for those here this day that do not know you, for those who have never placed their faith in you, Father, I pray that you would convict them. Pray you'd draw them to yourself. I pray you would make yourself known, real, and evident in their lives. And Father, I pray that the power of your word would accomplish the purpose for which you're sending it forth. And we're reminded that you have shared with us in your scripture that your word never returns void. So Father, we pray this day, we pray for a harvest. We pray for a harvest of lost souls. We pray for a harvest of those who step back into the right path of discipleship. We pray today that, that not only will souls be saved, but Father, we pray that rededications would transpire so that we might leave this place right with you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. It was Kierkegaard who said the uh, when it comes to matters of faith, every generation must begin again. How true that is. We live in a day where when you ask folks about their faith or about their relationship with Christ, you often hear answers like this. My father was a preacher or my grandfather was a pastor or my family donated the land where the church is setting or some story like that. But Kierkegaard, he didn't get everything right, but he got this right. In matters of faith, every generation must begin again. You see, faith is faith in Christ is not that which we receive by osmosis. It is not that which we merely pick up along the way. But your faith is independent of my faith, and my faith is independent of my daughter's faith or my family's faith or my friend's faith. You see, all of us must give an account before holy God as individuals based upon what we do with our faith. You may remember from our Sunday night series to the storm that Peter is writing here to a persecuted group. He's writing to a group that is downtrodden, to a group that is facing persecutions in ways that we honestly cannot imagine. Nero's the emperor in Rome. He's burned the majority of the city. He's blamed it on believers. He's literally having believers pulled apart by tying them to two horses. Sometimes they are uh, setting them on fire alive to illuminate the walkway to his parties. Believers in this day, in this age, those that 
that Peter's writing to, they're facing paramount persecution. But also, by the time this second epistle comes, not only are they inundated with persecution, but false teachings have become paramount as well. And we find that we live in a day where there's a lot of false teaching. But understand, ultimately, we are accountable for what we do with our faith. And ultimately, we will have to answer the question what, uh, regarding what we did with the facts of Jesus. What are we going to do about this Jesus this day? Will our faith be placed in him? Will we merely cast him aside and say that he's just one among many? Or will we ascribe to the testimony of Scripture itself? Scripture declares that Jesus is not merely one among many. He's not merely just a good teacher. He wasn't an overtly moral man alone. He was not just a little bit special but Jesus, the scripture declares, was God in the flesh. That Jesus was the one who came to die on Calvary's tree for your sin and for mine. You see, what you believe matters. As a matter of fact, it's been said that the opposite of joy is not sorrow. Let me say that again. It's been said the opposite of joy is not sorrow, but rather it's unbelief. You see, if you don't have belief this day, you really don't have joy. Oh, you might have happiness in some things. You might have happiness in who you are. You might have some happiness in where you are. You might have some happiness in what you have, but you don't have joy. You see, the opposite of sorrow and the opposite of joy is literally unbelief. Did you know that the Bible mentions the word faith 247 times? Out of those 247 times, 245 of them are encapsulated in the New Testament. Those two occurrences that we find in the Old Testament, one of those comes from Habakkuk 2.4. In Habakkuk 2.4, the Bible says there that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. We find that that verse is going to be quoted in Romans 1.17. It'll be quoted a second time in Galatians 3.11, a third time in Hebrews 10.38. So a total of four times in the pages of Scripture, we read that the just shall live by faith. Not by their own justice, not by their own justness, but rather they are called to live by faith. You see, this morning, church, our faith matters. Our faith matters exponentially. As a matter of fact, this was illustrated to young Derek. Derek was five years old. He had just started kindergarten, and one day he comes home with an envelope, and when he hands the envelope to his mother, she immediately recognizes that one of his teeth are inside. He's lost a baby tooth. And she says, oh, Derek, this is great. We'll put it under your pillow tonight. The tooth fairy will come, and, and uh, uh, he'll leave you a little something. Derek said, Mom, I'm not a baby anymore. I'm a kindergartner, and I don't want any more baby stories. Do you expect me to believe that, that some mythical creature in a pink tutu is going to come in here tonight, take my tooth, and leave a couple dollars under my pillow? Mom said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were a believer. And she said, we'll just throw your tooth away. A few minutes later, Mom overheard a conversation between Derek, five, and Lisa, who was nine. That's his older sister. Lisa says, Derek, you dummy. She said, do you realize how much money I've got from the tooth fairy through the years? As a matter of fact, Derek, you remember that Barbie doll I bought just last week? I got that from tooth fairy money. She said, you was just saying you wanted that new Star Wars toy. Uh, do you realize what you're going to miss out on by not believing in the tooth fairy? Derek run out of his room. He said, Mom, 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 hey, you know about that tooth fairy? He said, uh, he said, I forgot. I thought you were talking about, you know, one of those fairies like in the Wizard of Oz. I don't believe in those kind of fairies, Mom, but I believe in the tooth fairy. Hold on to that tooth you know what you believe determines what you receive now don't misunderstand me we, we shouldn't believe merely to receive and I'm talking about from a Christian perspective eternity but well, when we believe in Christ we find that we have an eternal destination a place that the Bible calls heaven and that's tied to our faith 
Some of you may be asking, well, what does faith mean? Well, the book of Hebrews gives us the definition of faith. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we read this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So notice, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is based upon that which cannot be crunched as empirical data. Faith cannot merely be measured by the normal metrics that we use to measure things in our world. Faith goes beyond that. Faith is believing in what you cannot see. It's believing in what you cannot always touch or manipulate or articulate. But faith, according to the scripture, accomplishes something very important because Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, reveals to us what faith is, but Hebrews 1-2 reveals to us what faith does. Notice what the second verse in Hebrews 11 says. We read there, For by it the elders obtained a good report. So we find that faith is the, the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And we find that faith enables us to receive and to obtain a good report. I don't have to convince you that life is coming to an end. I don't have to convince you that life is moving quickly. I don't have to convince you that yesterday we were young. For some of us, we're old and getting older. And for some, they've been getting older for quite some time, right? Life goes by quickly. Life is, is just as the Bible says, it's like a vapor. And there's coming a great balance, a, a great weighing out day or a great judgment day where our faith is going to be determined based on what we believe in. You see, there's no question today on whether or not you and I have faith. We all have faith. God has given uh, instricably, he's given to humanity faith. The question is, what are we placing our faith in? Where is our faith? That's the question of the day. When the Bible uses the word faith, it, uh, we find that it comes from the Greek word pistis, which literally means to be persuaded of something or to be convicted of something and to believe in it and to see it as truth. Well, notice here a few things that Peter is going to remind us of about faith. Catch this. Number one, faith is available. I mean, faith in Jesus Christ is available to you today. Have you ever watched someone going through life and you've had this thought, man, I wish I had their faith. I've got good news, you can. Have you seen folks going through difficulty and yet they seem unscathed and their, their countenance is, is smiling and their outlook is positive and their hope is steadfast and their conviction is resolute and you say, I wish I had their faith. Well, hear me this morning. You can have their faith. Notice what the Bible says here. Simon Peter is the first two words. My students know that uh, I, I'm big on the introductions to the letters. We, we miss so much by just glossing over what's said here. He, he could have said Simon. He could have said just Peter. He could have said Cephas. Jesus called him Cephas. That's the Aramaic for the Greek form Peter. But he says, I'm Simon Peter. When he says Simon, that's his Hebrew name. Literally, uh, in the Greek text, you see it's the transliteration of the Hebrew. So Peter says to the Hebrew folks, Here, here's my, my Hebrew name. And then he says, I'm Peter. So to the Greek folks, that's his Greek name. Peter reminds us that he's writing to a diversified audience. And do you know this morning we are diversified? I mean, we don't all look alike. We don't all sound alike. Some of you actually speak English, and I speak Appalachian American. Some of you this morning have hair, and I have none. As a matter of fact, some folks didn't know me last night at Trunk or Treat until I took my hat off, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's you. You know, uh, some of us are, are fuller in the hair and thinner in the body. As a matter of fact, I was preaching revival not too long ago, and I had been there a few times before. One lady came to me, and she said, uh, I don't remember you being here. I don't recognize you. And we got to talking about it, and we determined the issue was it had been five or six years, and the last time I was there, my head was fuller and my body was thinner. And uh, when I come this time, my body was fuller and my head's thinner. Are you, you tracking with me? 
We, we have diversity. As a matter of fact, some folks this morning, I, I was threatened, don't say Georgia lost again because they didn't lose. And, you know, I want Georgia to lose. We're, we're diversified in, in those that we pull for. We're, we're diversified in, in a, a myriad of ways. But here, when Peter writes to this diversified audience, he's going to bring them together on one point. And the point is, faith matters Faith matters. Can we say that this morning? Say that to me. Faith matters. All right, faith matters. And we find that faith is available. He starts out, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter first says, I am a servant, literally a doulos here, a, a bond servant of Christ, and he is an apostle. So he says, I've been called and I've been sent. Now, notice what he says next. To them that have obtained. Do you see that? Peter's writing and he says to them that have obtained. What have they obtained? They've obtained faith. And we find that because faith is obtainable, it's obtainable because God has given us a measure of faith. The Apostle Paul describes this in Romans 12, 3 when he writes this. For I say... Through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now catch that. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Do you see it? That's the article there, the, the measure of faith. God in his sovereignty has given to mankind a measure of faith. And you have free will what you do with your faith. Many of us, we put our faith in ourself or in our situation or in the, uh, the facade of securities that we think that we have. But listen to me, there's coming a day when you can no longer rely on yourself. And there'll probably be a day that, that your situation is not as it is today. And there'll be a day that, uh, that your securities can leave you very quickly. You know what I'm talking about. You don't have to go back too far in your memory. Many of you can remember just a decade or two ago, you could go into a grocery store and for $50, you couldn't carry out everything that you would buy. Today, you go in the same grocery store and for $200, you'll carry it out in just a handful of bags. Am I telling you the truth? You see, securities are not always what we think that they are. We have faith. Every man has been given a measure of faith. And true faith in Christ is available. But you and I have a responsibility to exercise our faith, to literally put it to work. Not only does Peter remind us here that faith is available, but look with me secondly. Peter's going to remind us that faith is valuable. Look what he says in the text. To them that have obtained what? Like precious faith. Do you see it? Like precious faith. The, the words here, like precious, comes from one Greek, the, the Greek word of sodomus. It, it literally means of equal value. Now, catch this. Don't get lost in the language for a second, but catch this. It was used in the first century to denote someone who was an immigrant who had immigrated from a foreign country into their current country and it, their, their citizenship was called a sodomist. It means just as good. Hear me this morning. When it comes to a, a relationship in Jesus Christ, all of us are immigrants. All of us were born separated from God by our sin. All of us this morning uh, that have been born again, we've been rescued by the marvelous grace of God. And here the apostle Peter says that their faith these discouraged, these downtrodden, these scattered believers. He says, your faith is just like my faith. That means something to me this morning. You see, I don't often think I have the faith of Peter. Do you? I mean, yeah, we, we see Peter's failure, and then we see Peter's restoration, and then we see Peter stand up on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 are saved. But when we follow the historical line of Peter, we find that he ends up being martyred for his faith. And when his life is about to be taken from him, Peter's last request was, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord. And Peter was crucified upside down as a result of that. 
This same Peter, he says, your faith is just like my faith. As I read in the pages of Scripture, uh, oftentimes we find these heroes of our faith. And yes, we see their failures because they were just men, just like you and I, flesh and blood. But we also see that they had great faith. And listen to me, that's why every biblical writer, every New Testament biblical writer was martyred save one. The only one that wasn't martyred was John. And you remember John was dipped in a bat of hot boiling oil, fried alive by the emperor Domitian, and then he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. The only reason he wasn't martyred is because he lived through it. You say, well, how could they hold their faith in the midst of that? Well, faith is valuable. Faith is valuable this morning. He, he calls it here this like precious faith. Let me show you why your faith is so important. If we look in Luke chapter 5 and verse 20, we hear Jesus say this, and when he saw their faith, catch it now, when he saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. You see, sometimes you think your faith only matters to you. But do you understand that what you do with your faith is going to affect your children? It will affect your grandchildren. It will affect your neighbors. It will affect your community. It will affect your church. Now, there's some theological wranglings here that we don't have time to untangle, but understand this. These four that brought this man to Jesus, Jesus understood their faith. They had faith or they never would have brought the man to him. Now, obviously, this man had faith in and of himself because no one's going to be saved on someone else's faith. But this man had the opportunity to place his faith in Christ because these four brought him to the Lord. Oh, wouldn't it be marvelous if over the course of a year, if every four of us in here brought one more? I mean, if, if it was just a four to one, if every four would bring one, can you imagine what the church would look like, what the church would be like over the course of a few years? Your faith matters. It is valuable. Peter says it is like precious faith it is valuable this morning but look in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 the apostle Paul writing here to the church at Ephesus he says for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God for by grace are you saved through what through faith you see faith is the vehicle that will take you to grace Jesus died for you and for me as individuals. And Jesus requires that we place our faith as individuals on him and in his substitutionary sacrifice. Oh my, our faith is valuable. And because our faith is valuable, we need to nurture it. Because our faith is valuable, we need to guard it. We need to take care of it. I've shared this before on a Sunday night, but... Through the years, many times, I've seen babies passed around. You know, when, when mom has the first one, that first one a lot of times, first one's not going to the nursery. You know, she's staying with mama. Over the course of a few weeks, mama laxes a little bit and, and they'll start to pass her. You ever seen a baby being passed in church? There's been many times I've thought, I want to hold the baby. I can preach and hold the baby too. Just one hand I hold. I hold the baby and preach, but no one's ever handed me the baby. But you know what I've never seen? I've never seen the baby pass like this. Hey, you, you want to hold her? You, you ever seen that? Hey, you, you, you want to hold him? No, we don't do it like that, do we? Because the baby is precious. We don't do that because the baby is fragile. We don't do that because of the value of the baby. Listen to me. When Peter says that our faith is valuable, we ought to nurture it like we do a newborn. We ought to safeguard it like we do a newborn. We ought to understand that our faith is often fragile. And we see that our faith is important. But look here thirdly. Not only is Peter going to say to us that faith is available and that faith is valuable, but Peter reminds us of where our faith comes from, and our faith comes from, from an immutable source. The word immutable, it just means unchanging or unchallengeable. Aren't you thankful that our Lord isn't changing? Aren't you thankful He's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Aren't you thankful that His promises are not void? Aren't you thankful his coming has not been delayed? 
Aren't you thankful that his watch care has not been put on hold? Listen to me. Barry may be quarantined, but Jesus is not. Amen? He's still all places at all times. We may be battling a pandemic and, and worried about COVID and germs, but Jesus is still the, the answer. He's still the antidote for sin. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And that's where our faith comes from. You see, you, you may not agree with me this morning. That, that's okay. You, you may not agree with me that man's fearfully and wonderfully made. You may think that we're a cosmic accident. Now, you'd be wrong. You, you may think that, that we were a single cell amoeba that crawled out of pond scum. That, that's what some of our science teachers teach us. Now, they forget to tell us that single cell amoeba, as soon as it crawled out of pond scum, it mutated. And by the way, when it crawled out of pond scum, it should have died. Single cell amoeba mutates, becomes a twin cell. That's a freak, by the way. Just I, I'm not being ugly. I'm just telling you the truth. And then they want me to believe that that twin cell amoeba then continued to mutate to the point where we are today, where there's over 300 trillion cells in our body I don't have enough faith to believe that I just don't I, but listen to me I'm not picking on you if you do I disagree but I'm, I'm not picking on you but here's what I would say regardless of what you believe about the origin of man and don't misunderstand me that is important but regardless of what you believe about the origin of man you have to agree that we have faith now, we might not all have our faith placed in the same thing, but God has instructably given us faith. We, we have the, the opportunity for faith. And we put our faith in a myriad of things. Where does that come from? It comes from God. It comes from him. Look at what he says here at the end of this verse. He goes on and he says that he's writing to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, don't miss this in this little introduction. I, I get so frustrated. Folks just read through this and they miss it. One of the most important Christological passages in the New Testament is right here. Right here, Peter says Jesus is not one among many, but Peter says Jesus is God. He says Jesus and God the Father, they are one. They're of the same. They're on a parallel plane. Jesus is not a, a God with a little g, but he's God here. Peter makes that clear and Peter is reminding us of where our faith comes from. Now, since our faith comes from an immutable source, our faith needs to be put into the one that's immutable. You see, you and I change. So remember, what, what do we often put our faith in? Self, situation, and securities. Self changes. Changes. There was a day that I, that uh, I played linebacker, a day that I played basketball, a, a day that, that I was involved in many things that I'm not physically capable of being involved in today. Self changes. Situations change. You understand that. And we find that our securities often change and that they can become depleted and they can become insufficient. And we often find ourselves deficient. But because our faith comes from an immutable source, our faith needs to be placed in one that's immutable, in one that does not change. Look at the, the word obtained. Look back at that in your verse. It's the Greek word lankano. It, it literally means to receive directly. You see, this faith that Peter's talking about, these folks didn't just merely run into it. It didn't just pop in their brain. Uh, they did not inherit it, but rather they received it directly. And if you want to receive the faith this morning, the faith that Peter has, if you want your citizenship to be secured in heaven, the same citizenship that Peter has, the same citizenship that believers have, then it's imperative that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Not in your works, not in your baptism. Did you know in a recent study among evangelicals, 74% of evangelicals surveyed said they believe that their good works aided their faith. In a recent study that I just conducted personally and published a paper as a result, over 30% of Bible college students, Baptist Bible college students declared they believe that their good works aided in the process of faith. There's a Greek word for that. It's baloney. It's not, not true. You see, our faith 
is a result of good works. And I mean, let me say it again. Our faith produces good works, but our good works doesn't produce faith. Let me clear that, that up. Our good works do not produce faith. Our good works should be a result of our faith. And yes, part of our, our works, it's going to be noticeable. I'm going to say that in just a second. But notice what Paul says in Romans 3.22. He said, even the righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. There is no difference. Some of us want to circumvent the system. We think that, you know, that, that maybe, maybe if we just are good people, if, we're, if we try to be moral or, or you know, we, we do more good than bad, somehow we have this idea this karma thing is going to balance out. But karma is not a biblical concept. You see, the Bible teaches we must repent and believe. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the only way. So here, Peter reminds us our faith has to be placed in Jesus as our Savior. But then lastly this morning, not only does Peter remind us in the facts of faith that faith is available and that faith is valuable and that faith is from an immutable source and as a result it should be placed in one that's immutable and that's only God. But lastly, Peter reminds us that faith is noticeable. True faith will be noticeable. Look what he says in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied into you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, catch this. At the end of verse 1, Peter declares that Jesus is the Savior. At the end of verse 2, Peter declares that Jesus is Lord. Jesus must be Lord and Savior of your life and mine. You see, Jesus is, is not merely Savior and then we do whatever, live however, no, no conviction, no change. Listen, that's not biblical salvation. As a matter of fact, the, the Bible warns us gravely about that type of faith and, and living it out in that way. As a matter of fact, many of us pray for our lost children, our lost friends, our lost family, and we pray for them like this. Lord, will you bring them back to you? I know they made a decision when they were 6 or when they were 7 or when they were 11 or when they were 17 or when they were 47, and they've lived like the devil ever since. There's never been a desire for God's Word, never a desire for God's Word, never a desire for the things of God and, and we, we pray Lord bring them home when we ought to be praying Lord shake them Lord save them Lord redeem them Lord give them true faith in you I, I know that's not popular preaching but we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven and all these folks that signed a card and was ducked in a baptistry and we never found them again we're going to be surprised that that's not the type of faith the Bible's talking about you see, the Bible talks about a transformed life. We, we don't have to live that way anymore. We don't have to think that way anymore. Literally, being born again not only changes your eternal destination, it changes your mind. And when you and I don't think in a way that's according to the Scripture, guess what? It's indicative that the work of the Word of God is not transpiring in our lives. Faith, this type of faith is noticeable. Now, where was I? I got carried away for a minute. Grace and peace. Some folks said they liked the background. Well, here's the background. Grace was the Greek greeting. The common Greek greeting was grace. The common Hebrew greeting was peace. Now, here it's irony, but it's, it comes from the, the Hebrew shalom. Shalom was a specific kind of peace. When the Hebrews would say to one another, shalom, shalom, what they meant was you have the peace of God because you're at peace with God. Now, while this is used numerous times in the New Testament epistles, grace and peace, do you know what you never find? You never find that peace precedes grace. Grace always precedes peace. You see, you'll never have the peace of God until you're at peace with God, and you'll never be at peace with God outside of the grace of God. Does that make sense? So here's what Peter says. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So uh, catch this again now. Peter says he's our Savior in one, he's our Lord in two. We, we need both. And then Peter says that faith is going to be noticeable, genuine faith, true faith, saving faith. It's going to be noticeable. Here's why. He says this is multiplied through the knowledge of God. Mark that word knowledge. It's the, the Greek word epinosis. Literally, this word means 
that it's knowledge you have received because you've worked, from, you've worked for it. Now, if you're any younger than, than me, you're not going to get this. So just hold on. Let me give you a history lesson. If you're younger than me, hold on. I'll give you a history lesson. There was a day when, when we wanted to know something, we did not pick up a device and click on Google. Shake your head this way. How many of you remember asking a teacher, how do you spell such and such? And she'd say, go get a dictionary. How many of you, like me, thought if I knew, how, not a, I got to know how to spell it to look it up. If I knew how to spell it, I wouldn't be asking. How many of you, yeah. yeah. But do you know what they were doing? They were teaching us how to spell it. And we, we would go, actually, I know this is archaic for some of you, but if there wasn't one in the room, we'd say, can I have a hall pass to go down the library? And you go down there, and you go in there, and you say, I need a dictionary. And you get a dictionary, and you pull that thing out, and you flip over, and you find, I mean, it's a process, right? And when you figure it out, you're like, oh, okay, that's how you spell. And listen, I'm not a great speller, but we learned to spell because that was a labor-intensive process, right? There was something else. There was not Wikipedia. Oh, I, I, I write on papers all semester. Wikipedia is not a scholarly source. Wikipedia is not a scholar. Don't use Wikipedia. Don't footnote Wikipedia in the paper you turn in. I write that all the time. But there was a day before Wikipedia. We couldn't go to Google. You remember what we would do? We'd go to an encyclopedia. Those things really existed. I mean, a wall full of them. And you would have to know the, the letter that the subject that you're wanting to study started with, you pull it out. And many of you, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not just milk, milking this. I know some of you say, hurry up, move on. Well, you know, I spent my childhood here. <laughs> and you, you find this subject, and you read the paragraph, and then it would say, see also some other subject. You're like, are you kidding me? Go back, put that baby on the shelf, pull out. A, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, guys, that's what we used to call research. And you know how we found those books? There was an electronic database. We went to a thing called a card catalog, pulled that thing out, and we, you, you know what I'm talking about. Well, when you learn, the, and listen, I, I'm thankful for Google. Google's the smartest person I know. I, I'm thankful. But oftentimes, we Google the same thing over and over and over because it's so easy, it's so quick. The, the knowledge comes, information comes, and it's so easy, it's not valuable. But many of you can remember things. I remember Mrs. Snyder. Mrs. Snyder determined that we would memorize and that we would recite a poem. I determined that I would outsmart her and I would find the shortest, easiest poem to remember in the history of man. I got up and I recited this, the shortest fight I ever saw, left to the body and a right to the jaw, the shortest fight I ever saw. She won. I mean, that's 40 years ago almost. Are you with me? She, she won. And by the way, you know how long it took me to find that? I went through dozens and dozens and dozens of poetry books. She won. I don't know what you think, but God's going to win. You might try to find a way to circumvent what God has decreed, but God has decreed that only those who are born again are going to heaven God has decreed that, that he loves the world and he, he gave his only begotten son for the world. But God's also decreed that we must place our faith in him. This faith is noticeable. And this faith, this faith is noticeable because of how it, it, it portrays itself and parlays itself throughout the entirety of our life. He says, grace and peace be multiplied into you through the knowledge of God. You see, the knowledge of God, it's that which we're, we're an active participant. That's what epinosis means. It means an active learner, one who's actively engaging in the pursuit of the knowledge and the admonition of the Lord. I want to know more about my Lord. How many of you remember that old song? Oh, I want to know more. I want to know more. I want to know more than I knew yesterday. Oh, someday, somehow, I want to know more, the song says. Where does that desire come from? It comes from the work of God in our lives. Faith is noticeable. Without question, you have faith. And I have faith. But the determining factor, the determining factor when everything is pulled away is where is our faith placed? Where's your faith? 
It's easy to have faith, as the McCamey sung about, when you're on the mountain and everything's good. It's hard to have that same faith when you're in the valley and everything seems difficult. But you see, with God, it's not all, we get hung up on the amount of faith, I think, sometimes. The Bible says God's given every man the measure of faith. You see, I, I'm persuaded, not all my theological friends agree with me, but I'm persuaded God's given us all a capacity for faith. I think he, he's placed that in every man, woman, boy, and girl, a capacity for faith. What are you doing with the capacity of your faith? Where is your faith? Is your faith in yourself? Is it in your situation? Is it in your securities? Or have you placed your faith in the one the Bible calls the Savior? You see, that's the only way. The, the only way to get out of this life alive is in Jesus. The, the only way. Ronnie used to preach a sermon, even when I die, I'm not going to be dead. Boy, that's head scratcher for some folks. <laughs> but even when we die, we're not going to be dead in Christ. This morning, would you place your faith in Him? Preach the word, preach the cross, preach redemption to